So, can you make it full screen? So last time we were, uh, we started discussing the mean and variance of one random variable. So I'm going to uh, continue with that and uh, pro pro most, in all likelihood we'll finish up al almost everything that you need to know about uh, one random variable today. So remember, where we were. Uh, we had a uh, density function uh, for any random variable. The area under the density function is one. The meaning of the density function is of course this area, if this is x1 to x2, then this area physically represents the probability that the random variable is between x1 and x2. Okay, so uh, then what we discussed was if you have a function of a random variable, in other words, uh, if you transform x to y, y equal to gx. Last week we spent time in how to find the density function of uh, y given the density function of x. So the, uh, so the random variable is completely characterized by its a density function. But the density function has a lot of information. So the question is, is it possible to describe the density, uh, de describe the random variable using one or two parameters? Parametric, uh, parametric description of random variables. Parametric description of uh, random variables. So remember, once again, you have a function. This function, we want to characterize by uh, represent this function by a few parameters. So obviously this is a lot of information. So we are trying to capture that using a few parameters as possible. I want to talk to you. Just put it on. No, I no, mean, no, stop the video, please. So, in terms of uh, parameters, uh, we are all familiar with the mean value. So, that always works mean of the random variable or expected value of x. So that's going to be a number. So it will, you can plot, so this is the mean value. I talked to you about the last time about the mean. So uh, easiest one is if you have a uniform random variable, a zero to A, and of course you can see mean is in the middle. And the mean value is uh, generally the description is you add all the information, add it up and divide by N. So, but, uh, or you can have a weighted mean or it's going to be x multiplied by fx x dx. I went through all this uh, last time. And if it is a discrete random variable, it is going to be xk multiplied by probability of x equal to xk. So if you write this as pk, then this will be summation xk multiplied by pk, wherever k is. Okay, so that's the description of mean. So then uh, we spend a little bit time computing mean and uh, mean for different random variables. And uh, so if you like, uh, take a look at uh, these two random variables. So mean is the 
average value, you can see that the mean physically for both these will be a here. So you have uh, two random variables. I call it uh, f1 of x, two different density functions, f2 of x. But they have the same mean. So it's clear one parameter is not enough. You cannot represent a function with the one parameter. You cannot represent a function with two parameters either. But at least uh, 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 the more parameters you have, you have more information about the random variable. So another thing we see looking at the density function is it's a width. How, uh, how closely does it hug the mean? That's, uh, so here you can see the, it's, a, it's, a, it's very flat around the mean. Here it is uh, more uh, pre, uh, concentrated around the mean. So, uh, uh, so we can use that idea to come up with a different... Uh, so uh, so if, a, if, it, if this is an observation x, uh, this quantity represents x minus mu. So you can call it to be some error. You, you pick up anywhere. So this is your uh, x minus mu. So that's the DVA. How far away is the random variable going to be compared to the mean? So, that, so if I call this to be error, uh, error could be plus side or minus side. So we can square it. And uh, it's, uh, so its average value, average value is expected value of that quantity should be of some significance, expected value of uh, uh, x minus mu the whole square. So expected value of x minus mu the whole square is you see the significance. We are trying to find out what's the, how far or what is the deviation from the mean of observations. Are the observations going to hug the mean or is it going to be all over far apart? So this quantity is of physical significance this is what we are going to call the variance of the random variable. Usually the notation is sigma x squared. Square is clear because if you expand it, it's going to be x minus mu the whole squared fx x dx. I went through this quickly last time. So this is positive, density function is positive. So variance of any random variable is always positive. So once again, variance is expected value of x minus mu the whole squared. This is a quadratic inside. So if I expand that, you get x squared minus two mu x plus mu squared. So this, if you expand, this is x squared minus two mu expected value of x uh, plus mu squared expected value of one. Expected value of a constant is the constant itself. And if you look at the middle term, uh, the expected value of x is, uh, uh, mu again. So this becomes minus 2 mu squared plus mu squared. So that gives you minus mu squared. So I can write this as expected value of x squared of minus uh, minus mu squared. So this is a formula we may use. You may want if you so if you want variance you don't have to compute this all the time. Uh, so you can write this as if you want expected value of x squared minus expected value of x the whole squared. So if you know the first moment and second moment, you can find the variance. So this is a useful expression. This is uh, more, uh, a lot of times, it, this is the way we compute the mean, use this expression. Remember, this is positive. So this quantity, for any random variable, this quantity is greater than, this quantity is greater than this quantity. I hope you see that, right? So we have, for any random variable, this is good. So see whether you can uh, go home and prove this. Do you see the proof right away? Anybody? The last, second expression? Yes? Yes or no? How do you prove the second one, second line? The first line I proved for you. How do you prove the second line immediately? What do you put x as? What will you substitute x as in the first line? What? Yeah, if you substitute uh, if you substitute x to the power n as y. Uh, so if you substitute x to the power n as y, you see this expression becomes. 
which is what we have above, right? Yes. So that's so that's always true. X to the power of four is you get so you have a free bead. X to the power of four is greater than uh, fourth of uh, sigma squared squared sigma to the power of four, etc. This is true for any random variable. That's the interesting part. <laughs> So another important expression that we developed was expected value of gx is integral gx fxx dx. This I derived it for you, so I'm not going to derive it. So he, we can use this to find all the central moments to compute the moments of like this x to the power n. These are called absolute moments. So for Gaussian, all this has been computed. And remember, one of one of the students pointed out, uh, and so I'll go through that iterative formula also. So the uh, question is, how did, I, I did few of them for you. What is it? Uh, Poisson. So I'll do a, a few more stuff. Let me start with Poisson. And a few of these random variables, uh, there are easy formulas. So for uh, Poisson, you'll start. We'll start with uh, to compute the moments. That's so. What is the expected value of x to the power four for Poisson? Right. So I'll develop uh, this formula for you expected value of x gx so by definition this is k uh, G, uh, remember gx is x gx k multiplied by gk multiplied by probability of <coughs> x equal to k right because it is poisson it is a discrete random variable that's the formula so that's going to be k multiplied by gk because that's your a function and the probability of x equal to k is e raised to minus lambda, lambda k over k factorial. So k goes from uh, 0 through infinity. When you put k equal to 0, the whole thing goes away. So k is 1 through infinity. And now I can cancel this k. And this becomes k minus 1 factorial. And I'm going to call k minus 1 to be m. So that wherever I see k, I'm going to substitute m plus 1. So this becomes a summation. Wherever I see, I'm going to put m plus 1, e raised to minus lambda, lambda to the power m plus 1, below m factorial. And m goes from, when k is 1, when k is 1, m is 0. So m goes from 0 through infinity. So I'm going to rewrite this as by, I will pull out a lambda outside. Then the rest is going to be summation g m plus 1, then you have e raised to minus lambda, lambda to the power m over m factorial. But this whole thing is expected value of g m plus 1. So this is lambda multiplied by expected value of g x plus 1. This is Chen's formula. So you will say, what's the big deal, right? So I'll, uh, so let me rewrite the last line in the next page. Uh, so what we have uh, developed is x uh, g x is lambda expected value of g x plus one. So I derived this for you. So what is its usefulness? So let me find out expected value of x. To apply this formula, I will assume, of course, gx to be 1. To apply this formula, so answer is x lambda multiplied by expected value of 1. So you get lambda. Remember, we derived this last time, but through a, all, all sorts of cancellation, this and that. Let's find out expected value of x squared. So that's going to be, I'm going to write it as expected value of x multiplied by x. So this must be your gx. So this is going to be lambda multiplied by, look at the formula here. If gx is x, g of x plus 1 is x plus 1. 
but expected value of x plus 1 is lambda plus 1. So you get lambda squared plus lambda. So from here you get variance of x is expected value of x squared minus mu squared. So this is your mu. Mu is lambda. So this is going to be lambda plus lambda squared minus lambda squared. So that's also lambda. So for Poisson random variable, mean and variance are the same. And we can use, I, I, can, I can use this to compute expected value of x cubed. That's going to be lambda multiplied by, so x cubed is x multiplied by x squared. So gx is going to be x squared. So this is x plus one, the whole square. So if you expand this, this is expected value of x squared plus two x plus one. So that's lambda multiplied by, expected value of x squared is somewhere here, lambda plus lambda squared plus expect two times expected value of x, that's two lambda plus one. So that's uh, lambda cubed plus uh, three lambda squared plus lambda, et cetera. So you can use this to find expected value of x4, x5, etc. All the moments. So of course, uh, for Poisson, you have this iterative formula. Poisson, you have expected value of x is lambda and expected value of xn is uh, lambda multiplied by expected value of x plus one, n minus one. So you use this to compute, you can use this to compute all the higher order moments. Yeah, why don't you ask them any questions? Now, how about the mean and variance of Gaussian? That's very important. So why don't you go home before I will go into that? Uh, why don't you try to find out uh, uh, these things for Poisson? See whether you can apply this formula and find the uh, fourth order and sixth order moments for Poisson random variable. So someone asked me, how do you characterize it? So, you can, if you want six parameters, then use the six means. Remember, these are like moments, right? Usually we try to get away with mean and variance. So I gave you a physical meaning of the mean and variance, right? So if you have two density functions, So this is one density function, this is another density function. So it looks like the mean is uh, for both of them, let's say somewhere here, this seems to be mean. So mean is the same, but you can see the density functions are drastically different. Remember area under the density function, both of them are one, but from the looking at the nature, so which one you think has larger variance? The first one or second one? First one has larger variance. See, look at the second one. Uh, if you, you expect the observations to be everywhere here, because it's all sort of likely, where here it looks like most of the observations will be here. So looking at the picture, we know that this one is less than sigma two squared, whatever is the variance of that. Why did you say first one? Do you see what I'm... So, or more dramatically, uh, this one is concentrated around this mean value, whereas here the mean value is the same. This is more, uh, like here, more distributed. So he, once again, if this is F1 and this is F2, so which one has lower variance? Anybody? Which one has lower variance? What? Yeah, the first one, right? So qualitatively, so you may say uh, two is not enough, then you go for other, uh, 
you go for the other, uh, you can go for the third moment, etc., etc. So, so let's say X is a Gaussian random variable with the density function. So this is standard normal, two pi sigma squared, not standard normal, zero mean normal, e raised to minus, uh, x squared over 2 sigma squared. Or let me put here mu, and then we'll see what's the meaning of those two. So this will be x minus mu the whole squared. So let me try to find the expected value of x. That's x multiplied by fxx. So fxx is this quantity. And I am going to substitute x minus mu to be some y. So y is x minus mu. So x is mu plus y. So when I rewrite, remember the, uh, the limits will be the same. So this will become y plus mu. Then you have e raised to minus y squared over 2 sigma squared and there's a constant outside here, 2 pi sigma squared. So if I expand this uh, dy, because dx is dy, so if I expand, I have two terms. One term is uh, mu multiplied by the density function of uh, x evaluated at y minus infinity to plus infinity. The other one turns out to be integral y e raised to minus y squared over two sigma squared dy with a constant outside. Let's deal with the second uh, integral first. What's the value of the second integral looking at it? Anyone? What? Why? Zero. Why is it zero? You're right. Because of odd function. Uh, this is even function. This is odd. So the product is odd over a, so over a symmetric region. So that's zero. How about the first integral? First integral? What's the value? Yeah, that's not uh, too much to think. That's an area under a density function. So this is one. So this mu turns out to be the mean of the random variable, x. Uh, right. So when whatever parameter is here, that's usually the mean. Not usually, that's the mean, right? So question is, what is the other parameter? So let's try to find out the variance of that random variable. So remember, the variance is expected value of x minus mu the whole squared. So that's x minus mu the whole squared multiplied by the density function. That's sigma squared e raised to minus x minus mu the whole squared. So you should go home and redo all this. So again, the same substitution. I'm going to call x minus mu to be y. So this becomes y squared. Look at here, y squared. And 1 over square root of 2 pi sigma squared e raised to minus y squared over two sigma squared dy. Same limits. So the question is, how do you do this? Anybody? So the uh, multiple ways to do this, let me show you a quick way. What is the value of this integral? That integral I wrote on the top. Anybody? The square root pi over two. What? What did you say? Look at it, it's a Gaussian integral. So what is it? Square root, then sigma squared. So I could write it like this, right? So that's an equal, that's an identity, right? That is an identity. I hope you see it because I, if you, this is just the constant which was here. I just brought it there. Area under the density function is one. Now we integrate both the sides with respect to sigma. 
So if I, I, I am sorry, not integrate, differentiate with respect to sigma on both the sides. On the right side, it is easy, 2 pi, 2 pi. What do you get here? It goes inside the integral. Let's hope I, so the quantity e raised to minus y squared over 2 sigma squared dy. I have to take the derivative of this. So that's minus y squared. What's the derivative, uh, and 2, what's the derivative of 1 over sigma squared with respect to sigma? Anybody? Minus 2 multiplied by sigma, two, sigma cubed, is it? Okay, very good. Look what I'm going to do now. I'm going to take this one sigma and put it here. I'll write it in the next line. Minus minus becomes a plus. And so two, two cancels, right? Minus minus goes away. So I have y squared over sigma squared e raised to minus y squared over two sigma squared dy equal to i I, I bring in one sigma here. I left, uh, sig there was sigma cubed, one sigma goes there. And if I put it under the square root, it becomes sigma squared. Now I'm going to rewrite it this way. I'm going to bring that constant here and I'm going to take the sigma squared to that side. It's just a small trick, but you get the value what you're looking for. And the, the last line is what we were looking for here in the previous thing. So this value is sigma squared. So what is the whole point? Uh, the sigma squared that has been coming in the uh, density fun in the uh, normal density function, uh, that's actually the variance because we <clears throat> So I hope you see this, right? So we got the variance by using this uh, symbol trick. So you differentiate both the sides with respect to sigma squared. So to summarize, for a normal random variable, this is the mean. Variance gives you some idea about this width. You can call this to be sigma. So then you call this region to be mu plus sigma. This is one sigma region. You are sigma away from the mean. This is two sigma region. This is, you are two sigma away from the mean. And this is three sigma region. So X is normal with the mean mu and variance sigma squared. So this is the meaning of uh, in the density function, usually all this is computed. So you can ask, what is the probability here? I don't remember exactly, but if this is something like 0.6, I think. And if you come up to here, maybe 0.85, if you come up to here, 0 0.95, etc. So by three sigma, it's already, if you go away from, I mean, considering both the sides, if you go up to plus minus three sigma from mu, mu it's already about uh, 0 0.9 or 9.5 or 9.8, etc. What does that mean? That means for Gaussian, most of the action is between minus three sigma and plus three sigma. That may not be so for other random variables. So this, the tail dies down very fast. So if you take X is exponential, uh, so fxx is uh, 1 over lambda e raised to minus x over lambda. If you write it in this form, expected value of x is, this is for you to do, x multiplied by density function. And if you put x over lambda to be y, and if you redo this, this will come out to be lambda y e raised to minus y dy, right? Because x over lambda is y. So dx over lambda is uh, dy. So I multiply by lambda to get out. But this integral is one. So lambda turns out to be the mean value of exp uh, the exponential. So you should go home and do all this. If you have a density function, try to find its mean and variance. So I'm going to leave you as an ex example. So notice if you, uh, people always get confused. What's the, um, variance of uh, 
what is the mean of lambda? If you write the density function this way, uh, with the lambda at the bottom, then uh, th that lambda is the mean. If you write that lambda, one over lambda as mu, e raised to minus x mu, then the mean will be mu, mu will be one over lambda. So it depends on which uh, way you write there. So, let me talk to you about characteristic functions. Uh, this is a tool to find, this is a very useful tool, it has many applications, but its uh, main uh, job is, uh, uh, today we will use it to prove a few things, including finding all the moments. Yeah. Can you ask them any questions? So expect, remember, we will start with this expression. Expect, expected value of gx is gx multiplied by fxx dx. So I'm going to take a special case of a gx. gx I'm going to take e raised to j omega x. So notice the random variable is in the exponent. So this is by definition e raised to j omega x fxx dx. And let me call this to be phi x of omega because it's going to be a function of omega, right? So this is a very special function, right? It's a special function with uh, this particular form. So the question is, what is its use? And uh, and how do you find it? So the key, the one, immediately I'm going to show that this function has got, you can, all the moments that about the random variable. So how we do this is, let me expand the right side. So this is one plus j omega x plus j squared omega squared x squared over two factorial plus etc. j n omega n x n over n factorial plus etc. So this is the expansion on the right side. So you may ask, so what? So you notice that put omega equal to zero. What's the value of the characteristic function at zero? Anybody? One. So that's the first property. Next thing, what we are going, I'm going to take the derivative of this expression on both the sides. What happens if I take the derivative here? Look at this. First term will go away. Second term, this will become. Uh, this, uh, d omega by d omega is one. So this will become j expected value of x. And the next term will be two omega in uh, three omega squared, etc. Then if you put omega equal to zero, all these terms will vanish. So let me do this uh, by sequence. So I'll rewrite here. So phi x omega is expected value of one plus j omega uh, x plus j squared omega squared x squared by 2 factorial. And let me take the derivative of this with respect to omega. I'm going to do on the right side. So look at the right side. This will go away. This will become jx. The next term will become j squared omega x squared over 2 factorial is gone. Uh, the this term will become jn will be there 
but n n cancels so omega n minus 1 but x n over n minus 1 factorial so now if i put omega equal to 0 all these terms will go i'll get this so you get omega prime 0 is simply j multiplied by expected value of x so you get expected value of x is 1 over j the de first derivative of the characteristic function evaluated at zero now go back to this expression and take the second derivative if you take the second derivative look at here so go back here there is no derivative here because there is no omega remember derivative is with respect to omega this will become so the first term will be j squared x squared and then etc here this will become uh, j n but uh, omega will become n minus 2 and this will become n minus 2 factorial etc but x n so if I, now if you the next one will have an omega here so if i put omega equal to zero all this will go you will get x squared so expected value of x squared is 1 over j squared the characteristic function second derivative evaluated at zero. So if you keep uh, going that way, you can get, uh, you should be able to see if I do the derivative of this n times, I can use this expression. So I take the derivative of uh, the characteristic function n times and then evaluate n equal to zero. So this is the expression. That's a useful expression. I just derived it for you. So let me find the characteristic function of few random variables and show you. Uh, so let's, I, I also need this uh, x is binomial NP. Let's find out its characteristic function. So remember, probability of x equal to k is n choose k, p to the power k, q to the power n minus k. Oh, yeah. You read it to me. Okay, I'll answer that. I'll come to that in a second. So let me finish this. So the, what is the characteristic function of this? So this is by definition expected value of e raised to j omega x. So that's since it is discrete, it is. So this is like expected value of gx. So that's going to be gk multiplied by probability of x equal to k. So that's going to be, so characteristic function of uh, exponent uh, binomial is, remember, here gk is e to the power j, uh, j x omega k, because this is your gx. gx is this function. So instead of gk, I'm going to put this up. So this is going to be e raised to j omega k, probability of x equal to k. So that's going to be summation k goes from 0 through n. Uh, e to the power j omega k, n choose k, p k, q to the power n minus k. So here p is raised to the power k. So I'm going to put all the raised to the power k together. So this is n choose k p e raised to j omega to the power k, q to the power n minus k. p and this, I put it together. But this is of the form a plus b to the power n. So I can write this as, this is a, this is b. That's the binomial expansion of p e raised to j omega. Uh, 
So if I take the derivative, I can find its mean and variance. So let me just do this one or two examples just to give you an idea. So here is another tool for you to find the mean and variance. So let me take the derivative of here right away. So the derivative of this is, remember derivative is with respect to omega. There is no x here. So what's the derivative? Let's use the derivative formula. n multiplied by p e raised to j omega plus q to the power n minus 1. Multiplied by, anybody? Multiplied by what? P, derivative of this quantity, right? With respect to omega. What's the derivative of this quantity with respect to omega? Not j omega. P is a constant, so there will be P. Derivative of this quantity with respect to omega, which is what? What's the derivative of E raised to J omega with respect to omega? J types? J E raised to J omega. Now put omega equal to zero. Look here. This E raised, this will become one. So P plus Q is one. This will become one. What do you see? What do you get? So the derivative evaluated at zero is this. Now you divide by j, you divide by j. So you will get NP, which is the mean. So we get the same result we had before. Now let me take that expression and take the second derivative. Okay, so you remember you have it there. I'm just going to copy it. So we had before, the first derivative was, uh, what was it, uh, j n p e raised to j omega, then you had uh, p e raised to j omega plus q to the power n minus one. This is what we had. So now it of course gets messy, but so I'm going to do the second derivative with respect to omega. This is a constant, so j n p will stay there. So this we will do by chain rule. So what's the derivative of the first quantity? Anybody? What's the derivative of e raised to j omega? Hmm? We just went through this. Okay, so derivative of this multiplied by that function, so that's this. Plus the first function multiplied by the derivative of this. What's the derivative of this function? n minus 1 multiplied by the derivative of this, which is? What's the derivative of the inside quantity? This is the, now we need the derivative of the inside quantity. N minus one multiplied by this raised to one power less, which is here. And the derivative of the inside quantity is P J E raised to J omega, right? Yes. Now put omega equal to zero. Let's see what happens. So of course you have to do this correctly. J and P. There's a J here, there's a J here. So I'm going to pull it outside. Then uh, omega equal to zero, this is one. This is P plus Q is one. So this is one plus this is one. This is one. So I have P multiplied by N minus one. I hope this is right. Let's see what we get. So if you expand this, so I'm going to pull j squared here. So double prime evaluated at zero is NP multiplied by, if you expand this, I get NP plus one minus P, that's Q. So if I expand this, I get NP squared plus NPQ. But NP squared is, so this is the second derivative. This is the second derivative divided by j squared. So this is expected value of x squared. So we get expected value of x squared is npq plus np the whole squared. But np the whole squared is the mean squared. So the variance of x is expected value of, remember this is the mean, x squared minus mean squared. So that will turn out to be npq. So we use the characteristic function to find the mean and variance. 
Any questions? It's too late, but I will answer. So e raised to j omega x, omega is a new variable. j is square root of minus 1. Of course, you have e raised to j pi. What is the answer? Anybody? e raised to j pi? Very good. So that's the meaning of j, if you don't know the j. j or i, square root of minus 1. Omega is a new variable. I hope you saw what see uh, so if you do the expected value of x this quantity of course it will turn out to be a function of omega the new variable because expected value of uh, so this quantity is going to be integral e raised to j omega x fx x dx so those of you who are familiar with the fourier transform can see that we are actually using the fourier transform properties this is the fourier transform of the density function so in the Fourier transform, there is a new variable, omega. So that's the same variable here. If you, you can associate it with the frequency if you want, but there is no need. So uh, before I proceed, there was a question, what's the difference between, anybody? Before I answer, what do you think? What is the, anybody in the class, what's the difference between, what was the question? Yeah. Yeah, well, anybody, what's the difference between these two quantities? Anyway, the names are... Uh, so remember, mean is very meaningful, right? Mean is meaningful. And uh, this quantity is very meaningful because this is the error associated. So if you have an observation here, then this quantity refer, uh, de uh, represents the deviation from the mean. So you can say, uh, remember the mean idea, mean is where uh, if you observe a lot of times, you expect the average value to be mean. So the question is, how far away are you going to be from the mean? We want a measure. So this is the error. So the expected value of the mean squared error. So this is, uh, is what is with the variance. So this is makes sense. It is quite meaningful. This is this, you can say that this is a similar expression uh, with uh, where the, this is here you could say that the, uh, you are doing the same thing except with respect to origin because mu is zero. It's the same expression with, so you could say that these are the moments one way to say that these are the moments about the zero. And so these are the moments about which point? Anybody? These are the moments centered around the mean value. So these are the moments with respect to the mean. These are the moments with respect to the origin. So you have the same expression. Uh, what I meant was expected value of xn versus expected value of x minus mu to the power. Yeah. Any questions? So now we can use all this to get some new results.
So remember, as you go away, farther and farther away into the tail, the x value becomes large, right? So if you if the x value represents the strength of a hurricane or the wind speed, so the question the farther and farther away you go, the, you are talking about higher and higher wind speed, which will could be damaging, etc. The question so usually you see whenever something happens, uh, you know you have an average wind speed and. Hopefully, think if things are around there, that's something you can handle. Or same thing with the flood. This is the average flood level. So, but if you say my, uh, year after year, I am going to be in the tail far away, that means the flood levels are very bad, very high. So the question is, what is the probability in the tail? So, of course, if the probability in the tail is very, very small, then you know it's very unlikely to happen. So something what we are interested in is always this. So if you make mu equal to k sigma, this is a meaningful question to ask. So let's look at the expression. That means what is the probability that the, the random variable being away from the mean is more than epsilon, k times sigma. So sigma, this is a usual thing to say. If, k, if you put k equal to three, what we are asking is what is the probability that the random variable, the wind speed or the flood level or the snow level for next year is going to be, let's say the average snowfall we know for New York City, whatever, a couple of feet, I think, right? So what is the, and you know the variance also, mean and variance, because you take the last 100 years of data. Uh, so you, you may say the variance seems to be about one, one foot and the mean is, let's say, two feet of snow. Question is, what is the probability that the next year, uh, the actual snowfall, which is X, will be larger than the mean uh, beyond K sigma? Let K, let's say K to be two sigma or three sigma. Can it exceed a three sigma? That's a good question to ask. Of course, it will depend on the density function you are dealing with. If you know the density function, you can do the integration, right? <clears throat> So I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Generally, so you have a density function, you want to compute this tail probability beyond this point, beyond this uh, expected value. So this distance, you want it to be K, uh, epsilon, epsilon away from mu. So if you keep increasing epsilon, you are going to be in the farther and farther. So of course, if the tail probability is very small, then those probabilities are negligible as you go away. So the question is, of course, the issue here is, you need the density function to figure out this probability. Of course, if I tell you Gaussian, you can compute it. But generally, take the snow in New York City or the flood level, we have no idea about the density function. So the question is, that's where these bounds come. Can you figure out this probability without knowing the density function? So look what I'm going to do. So this is uh, one bound, such bound by Chebyshev. Uh, there are many bounds. If I get time, I'll talk about Chernoff bound also. But that is a little more <coughs> work. So remember, I'm computing the tail probability. So let me start with sigma squared. This is easy. We all know what it is. So you can see with the knowing a little bit, we can go a far, far away. So this is by definition x minus mu, the whole squared, fx, x, dx. Yeah, can you ask him whether that explanation was enough? To the student. Now look what I'm going to do here. Uh, pay attention on the board.
So remember, sigma squared is a known quantity uh, here. So this means I need to integrate over the whole region. This is a positive quantity. This is positive. But what if I integrate only over a partial region? Anybody? Same quantity. Everything stays the same. Which integral is larger? The one above or below? Here I'm only integrating over a partial region. So which integral is larger? Top one or bottom one? Upper one. So we can write this this way, yes? Now look at the bottom. This is, so x minus mu is beyond epsilon. What if I substitute epsilon here for x minus mu? In other words, uh, everything has to say, say the same. Here I'm going to substitute epsilon squared fxx dx. Which integral is larger, this or this? I'm substituting the smallest value here. Look, the smallest value is epsilon. I'm, that's what I'm plugging in here. So which integral is uh, larger? This one or this one? Anyone? What? Everybody, it's clear, right? So again, you have this. So let me take, a, uh, this is a constant, so I'm going to pull this outside. So we have sigma x squared is greater than epsilon squared integral but look at this uh, this is precisely the stale probability this one these two probabilities in the tail so, so that probability is probability of x minus mu uh, greater than epsilon so that's that quantity so we have probability of x minus mu greater than epsilon is less than or equal to, I plug it in here, sigma x squared over epsilon squared. So that's Chebyshev, it's a very simple, that's Chebyshev's uh, inequality. So what's the big deal here? Big deal is you didn't even know which density. This is good for all density functions. That's interesting thing. So probability that, look at what I'm saying. Probability that the random variable will exceed the mean by k sigma is going to be less than or equal to sigma squared over k squared sigma squared. Sigma squared cancels, you get one over k squared. So look, here is the theorem. For any random variable, the probab probability that things will go beyond three sigma. What is the probability? Things will go beyond three sigma. Look at here. It's going to be less than one over nine. So there is only a 10% chance that things will exceed three sigma for any, any random variable on the planet. For Gaussian, of course, we can compute and show that it is only 0.1 or something. I'm saying even if you didn't know, so saying that, oh, what if I get, uh, so if the mean value is something, if the mean uh, income is something and the standard deviation is, you know, what about $1,000, then saying, oh, what about getting a 10 times the raise? It's very, very uh, unlikely because the probability that uh, the maximum, uh, usually things happen within plus minus three sigma of the mean. So what is the moral of the story? For any random variable, let me put it this way. So I purposely wrote a density function, the peak value, this is the mode, M-O-D-E. -E. Mode and mean doesn't have to be the same. This is the mean. And let's say this is mean plus three sigma. This is mean minus three sigma. So this region is where most of the action Most of the events. How much most? Uh, so the uh, more than uh, one minus nine, eight by nine, right? Right? Because uh, less than one, uh, the probability outside is uh, for any random variable, it is less than one over nine. That means uh, eight over nine, whatever it is. What is it? 80%, 85%. So most of the time, all the action is going to be here. Of course, this is assuming I know the mean and variance. Right? So this is three sigma. 
This is minus three six. So that's the significance of uh, Chebyshev's uh, inequal. So if you knew uh, Gaussian, etc. Uh, so this is where you uh, remember somebody was telling me he saw a video of mine on the this particular Gaussian. So Gaussian, we can uh, do a little better. How does it go? Uh, so let me derive a similar inequality for Gaussian, tail probability. So I start with the Gaussian density function. I assume the mean to be zero. Let me take the derivative with respect to x. So derivative with respect to x, look here, is derivative of this quantity, that's what, minus x over s. So that's the derivative of uh, x. Derivative of the density function with respect to x. So for Gaussian, so remember this is for Gaussian. So for Gaussian, I am deriving a, so I hope you see, what we have here is a Chebyshev inequality here, but Chebyshev inequality is true for all random variables, any density function. So this has to be a weak bound because it cannot be some, some random variables go very fast, some random variables go slow, so this must be true for all of them. So this has to be a weak bound. So let, let's try to do something for Gaussian by itself. So which is what I'm going to do. I, I'm, you can see this relation I'm going to use it a little later. So this relation is true only for Gaussian random variables. So for Gaussian this is uh, so this is of course x minus mu beyond uh, epsilon, right? And uh, as, so the, you can write this as x beyond epsilon with the mu equal to zero. So this is x beyond epsilon fxx dx. So this is going to be, so let me rewrite this as x over x fxx dx x greater than epsilon. And I'm going to put the smallest value here. So uh, this I'm going to write it as integral epsilon. So which one is, uh, look at here, everything else is the same. The smallest value is epsilon. If I put it here, which one is larger, this one or this one, anyone? It's this way, isn't it? Or the other way. Hmm? The other way, right? Yes. You have no opinion. 
Anyone? Which way this inequality goes? In the denominator, I'm going to put the smallest value. This is a constant. This is not a constant. So which one is larger? Is this right? Yeah, that's right. That's true. So this is can be written as one over epsilon integral x fx x dx or x greater than epsilon. But remember, I'm this is this much is true for any random variable. Now I am going to use this Gaussian property. For Gaussian, we had this expression. So let me. Uh, Uh, so x of x is minus sigma squared f prime. So we have probability of x greater than epsilon is uh, less than or equal to 1 over epsilon integral x greater than epsilon. Uh, what was it? Minus sigma squared f prime x. So this is going to be 1 over epsilon epsilon to infinity. So sigma squared goes outside with a minus sign. Uh, F prime x. Dx. So derivative of uh, integral of the derivative is the function itself. So this is minus sigma squared epsilon uh, uh, multiplied by F of x uh, epsilon to infinity. Uh, the density, this is the Gaussian density function. At infinity it is zero. So the minus will go away and you will get sigma squared over epsilon f of x uh, epsilon. So if I substitute this is sigma squared epsilon 1 over square root of 2 pi sigma squared e raised to minus epsilon squared over 2 sigma. So one sigma cancels. This is on one tail. If you want, you can put it to the other tail also. So I hope you see that probability of x greater than epsilon is Remember, there's an, so there's an inequality and then equality. So this is less than or equal to this quantity. So one sigma cancels away. So this is goes away. You have sigma over So I hope you see what I did, right? So this is probability of x greater than epsilon is less than or equal to. This is only on the positive side, right? Other side is exactly the same. So two times this quantity. So that's why I brought in two here. One sigma cancels off, two two cancels off. So you get square root of two over pi sigma over epsilon. So uh, even if with the mean, it is the same. So because you just, you just, the density function, you just have to do a small sub. So if x is Gaussian with the mean mu and variance sigma squared, then the probability that the random variable will uh, minus the mean will be will exceed epsilon is given by this tighter bound. This is a much tighter bound because you have e to the power something going on. In the previous case, you only had. Chebyshev was, what was it? Uh, just uh, sigma squared over epsilon squared, right? So you have to compare with this one. Not uh, this is less than or equal to. So I hope you see this is, the bottom one is Chebyshev. The other one is good for Gaussian. Yang, why don't you ask them any issues? So what's the difference? I hope you see it. This is not a this is a weak bound. Whereas on the on the Gaussian one, you can see you have e to the power minus f squared, which will substantially uh, much much smaller. So for the Gaussian, if you put uh, epsilon is equal, let's put epsilon equal to k sigma. Let's see what it is. So I'm going to put epsilon equal to k sigma. This cancels.
This, that's the Gaussian bound. So we derived this bound. This is the same tail. So if you know the density function to be Gaussian, you know how it goes away. Whereas for if you don't know the density function, all we can say is uh, one over k squared. That's, uh, so obviously the top one is tighter because put k equal to three, e raised to minus nine over two is practically extremely small. So you, you can uh, you can go home and see how much is that quantity. So that's, it will say it's less than 0 0.001 or something. Whereas this is only one over nine. Uh, for k equal to three. Any questions? Yes. Why don't you ask them anymore? So since Gaussian is important, let me compute the characteristic function of Gaussian. For Gaussian? So the multiple ways, if X is uh, Gaussian with the mean mu and variance sigma squared, then you define Y to be X minus mu. So Y will be Gaussian with the mean. So this is, this is the easiest way. So the tail a probability of uh, for Y greater than epsilon is less than or equal to our probability, right? two over pi, what was it, one over epsilon. Uh, so remember, it's only a translation by thing. So this is uh, this is the probability of y. Uh, so this is what we have derived. <coughs> but then, if you make this simple transformation, because the density function just gets shifted, that's all. You can, of course, you can go back to fundamentals if you want. But this is probably the easiest to. What I have done is uh, for this random variable, which is this. So for y greater than epsilon is the same as y is x minus mu. So the probability of x minus mu. So this is probably the quickest explanation. In other words, assume, I mean, what we have done is for the second line, then you make this translation, that's all. Because the mean doesn't come on the right side, you can see, a shift, a shift is not going to change the probability. <coughs> There's a question. So this you should know how to do this. So I'm going to do this for you. It's there in my notes. So this is e raised to j omega x. So this is e raised to j omega x multiplied by the density function. Right. So I'm going to substitute y equal to x minus mu. 
So this becomes e raised to j. So x is what? Mu plus y. E raised to j omega y plus mu. So dx is dy. So you get this. Minus infinity to plus infinity is still. Right? Now I'm going to pull this uh, one constant outside. So this I can write it as e raised to j omega mu. Then you have e raised to j omega y e raised to minus y squared over 2 sigma squared y. This is a constant, so that goes outside. Uh, so let me start with that expression is e raised to j omega mu x minus infinity to plus infinity e raised to j omega y minus f y squared over 2 sigma squared. This is in the exponent, right? dy. So I'm going to uh, e raised to j omega mu. I'm going to pull out this two omega squared outside and write this as right i pulled out y outside minus y outside 2 sigma squared outside so it becomes y minus 2j omega squared so i'm going to make a substitution so let me substitute y minus j omega squared omega j sigma squared omega to be u So this becomes e raised to j omega mu. So y becomes, look at here, y becomes u plus j sigma squared omega. And y minus 2j sigma squared omega becomes u minus j sigma squared omega. So when I multiply these two, y multiplied by this, y is here, I'm sorry, y is here, this is here. So that's going to be e raised to minus one over two sigma squared. This becomes u minus j or u plus j sigma squared omega multiplied by u minus j sigma squared omega. And uh, dy is du, but this is a plus, a plus b multiplied by a minus b. So this becomes e, e raised to j omega minus infinity plus infinity. And I lost the constant here. So let me put back the constant. E raised to minus a squared minus b squared. A squared is this. B squared is j squared. J squared is minus one. Sigma four omega squared divided by two sigma squared. So again, there's a term without u. So I'm going to take the constant outside. So the phi x uh, omega becomes e raised to j omega mu. Then let me pull out this term outside. This is plus, right? There is a j squared here, right? Minus j squared is plus because look, u plus j omega squared. 
a plus b a minus b a squared minus b squared a squared is here minus b squared is j squared minus j squared is plus so when i pull this outside minus plus is minus e raised to minus sigma 4 and sigma squared would cancel omega squared sigma squared by 2 then you have an integral then you have the square root of this then you have e raised to minus u squared by 2 sigma squared du anybody what's the value of this integral look at that integral what is it one because it's just an area under a gaussian density function so whatever is remaining must be the characteristic function of gaussian So this is an important result. If X is Gaussian with the mean mu and variance sigma squared, then its characteristic function is uh, so if X has zero mean, the characteristic function looks like the same bell-shaped curve. Mu is zero, so the first term is gone. That standard goes in. So remember, as I did last time, you can take the derivative of this function and find out its uh, mean, etc. Mean and variance, all the higher order moments. But we can use this formula to derive an iterative function. So let me do that. That's what that was the whole topic of that video. But do you see this? Again, you have a, a bell-shaped function here. This is the characteristic function. So for a standard Gaussian, the density function and the characteristic function has the same shape. Except look at sigma squared. Sigma squared is at the wrong place. In one place, it's in the denominator. For the density function, it's e raised to minus x squared over 2 sigma squared in the denominator, whereas here it is in the numerator. Except for a constant here, right? So it's the same shape, same bell shape. So if sigma squared is small, uh, the characteristic function will be concentrated, but the density function, I mean, density function will be concentrated, but characteristic function will be uh, expanded, except or the other way. So if you want to prove something is Gaussian, all you have to show is the whatever you are trying to prove has a characteristic function which looks like this. So everything you don't hit by, some, so sometimes the characteristic function works out well. So I'm going to use, I'm going to show, use this result. So again, if x is zero and variance, x is normal with zero mean and variance sigma squared, it's characteristic, this is this at least uh, sigma squared omega squared by two. So if um, sigma squared is one, it's it simply e raised to omega squared by two. Any questions? So I'm going to use the characteristic function to prove this result. Remember, we already proved that a binomial looks like Poisson 
there was another result, right? Pre I, I hope you remember binomial uh, tends to be a poison. So these are different conditions. If uh, n tends to infinity, but p should go to zero, such such that n p is a constant lambda. Uh, then binomial tends to poison. This I proved in class. Yes, do you remember? A couple of classes back, right? So this is a different result. That says, if n is large in a binomial, in other words, if you keep, to keep tossing a coin thousands and thousands of times, the PDF will turn out to be binomial. So that I'm going to prove it using, many ways you can prove it. I'm going to use it there just to show you an application. So the, my point is the characteristic function, it was invented not just to compute the moments, it has got other applications. So anytime you can play with uh, characteristic functions and show that some random variable, or maybe a function of a random variable, uh, behaves like, uh, Uh, has a characteristic function which looks like this, then we can conclude that that random variable must be Gaussian. That's how you can do it. That's why I'm going to prove this uh, de Moivre Laplace theorem. So remember, that's the reason I already did the characteristic function of, uh, so let's say X is binomial with the parameters N and P. If you check your notes, I already did the characteristic function for you. Anybody remembers? To the power? Huh? What was the characteristic? All you have to do is check your notes. What? One, n minus one. Look again. Anybody? Why did you say n minus one? What do you get? Go, go back to your notes, couple of... Uh, a couple of pages back. Yes, you have it, right? Yes or no? So that's where we, we want to show that this somehow, if n go, goes up, this is going to, so anybody remembers what was the mean of an X binomial? Hmm? Very good. And variance? NPQ. We derived this. So let me define a linear combination of uh... so I sort of normalized this Y. So look what I have done. It's a linear, uh, I haven't changed much. I just, I make this uh, new random variable. So let's hope I can do this correctly. So all I have done is that, uh, because look, X is sigma Y plus mu, a linear transformation. So I have in the, I'm not saying Y is binomial or anything, but I'm going to look at the the properties of Y. Question is, uh, how do you find the density, uh, uh, the density function of Y? So I'm going to actually look at the characteristic function of Y okay. and see what happens. If I see something familiar, then I can jump into a theorem. So, so look, y is x minus mu over sigma, or this is the same as x is uh, mu plus uh, sigma y. So x is binomial with uh, np. 
and so and y is just a so y is a linear transformation those so a characteristic function is e raised to j omega y so let me go to the next page or here so e raised to j omega y is what x minus mu over sigma so this is uh, two terms right e raised to j i can pull out the constant outside so the remember y is x minus np over square root of npq so the characteristic function of y is e to the power minus j mu np over square root of npq and you have phi x of e x over uh, square root of Okay, e raised to j, uh, e raised to j mu over sigma, mu over sigma. This is the characteristic function of x evaluated at x over sigma, x over sigma. Yes. What? Where is what? What was the question again? Yeah, yeah, you are right. So there is a omega here. This is what you are saying. Yeah. And so there is an omega here. There is an omega here. Thank you. So let me expand it again. Everything is good. I hope I would have caught it now. So there is an omega here. There is an omega. Right, exactly. And uh, remember, I have this expression. So I'm going to, we have the characteristic function of x evaluated omega here. So I'm going to substitute this here. So this is going to be e raised to minus j omega np over square. So you have to follow me quickly and I should not make mistakes. So, instead of, instead of, so this is the characteristic function at omega. Here we have, so there is no x here. This is, here you have omega over, remember this is the characteristic function of evaluated at omega over sigma, omega over sigma. So this is going to be P e raised to j omega over npq plus q to the power n. So I hope for that much is correct. So ask everybody, everybody is good with this? Any questions? So I'm going to take this quantity inside now. Remember, there is a power n here. So when it goes inside, this power n goes away. So let me do it carefully. And you can catch me if I make mistakes. You should. So look here. Uh, easier thing is here. With the, so this is going to be something to the power n. Let, let's write the second term. Second term is e raised to minus j omega p over square root of npq. And the first term, you have a p here. When this goes inside, look look at the board first. See, there is an omega here, omega here. N goes away because there is an N here. So this will be 1 minus P. 1 minus P is, what is it? 1 minus P. What? Yeah, Q. So isn't this correct? Oh, 
always. So let's hope, the, I mean, uh, I, because the denominator is the same, the, the new n goes, uh, because it is raised to the power n, uh, omega is common, then you have one minus p with a plus sign, that's q. So now I am going to expand uh, this as using the e raised to a, a, e raised to x. e raised to x is what? One plus x plus x squared, etc. So this is going to be uh, p multiplied by one plus j omega q over square root of n p q plus square j, uh, plus j squared omega squared q squared over 2 NPQ plus ha, ha, other terms. This term will be to have power n to the power 3 by 2 plus etc. This is just a P plus Q multiplied by 1 minus omega P is a J here square root of NPQ minus. So let me write it in the next page. I'm going to rewrite this. So this is, uh, so the first term is one plus J omega Q over square root of NPQ plus J squared omega squared Q squared over two NPQ plus terms, but the denominator is going to be three by two uh, squared, etc. So that's just the first term on P. The next term on Q is one minus j omega p over square root of npq then minus will become the then uh, pl uh, plus j squared omega squared p squared over 2 npq plus again same thing one over n to the power 3 by 2 plus etc and the whole thing to the power n. <clears throat> so let's expand it. Look at here, first term is p, here it is q. p plus q is? p plus q, one. And look, let's look at the next term. Here you have uh, p, j omega p q with a plus sign here, j omega p q with a minus sign. So what happens to this omega terms, anybody? Omega term. Hello? Omega term is look at here, here PQ minus PQ. So that goes away. So what about the next term? J squared is minus one. J squared is minus one. Here you have PQ squared. Here you have QP squared. And here PQ is common, a PQ is at the bottom. So PQ you can pull out. So I hope you see this. This is omega squared, PQ squared plus QP squared. So PQ common, then you have P plus Q, then you have NPQ here with a two. So PQ, PQ cancels. And then you have other terms to the power three by two more, etc. So I hope you see this, this term is gone. This is now one minus omega squared over P plus Q is one. So you, here you have just this, plus terms involving with higher power. So I'm going to write it like this, to the power n. So I hope you see this, uh, everything worked out. But anybody remembers what is the, if you push n to infinity, what is the expansion of one minus x over n to the power n? We went through this last time a couple of weeks back. Anyone? Or you can expand this in binomial. I hope you understand what I'm asking is. Anybody remembers this? Tends to what? As n tends to infinity. What is the expansion of that? E raised to x. E raised to? Raised to x. I mean, you you guys are graduate students. This is very weak. E raised to minus x. So how do you prove this? 
So I suggest you go home and expand this as binomial. So then you will see one minus x plus x squared by two or minus x cubed by three factorial, etc. It will come, there will be some n terms. Then you push n to infinity, you will get the expansion of e raised to minus x. This may be, what is it, one minus n or something here. So if that is the case, this is just the expansion of e raised to minus omega squared by two. It's the characteristic function of y. Because this is your x with a minus sign. So what we have proved is if x is binomial, So let's, do, let's see what we have proved. I have proved that if X is binomial uh, with parameters N P, NP, so that mu is NP, sigma squared is NPQ. And if I define Y to be X minus NP over square root of NPQ, then we, what we have shown is sigma square Y as a characteristic function, which is like this. That's the result on the previous page. Okay, after all this manipulation, you get this. But remember a few pages back, this is the normal Gaussian, standard Gaussian. So what we have proved is why is Gaussian? Why it tends to be Gaussian? Why it tends to be Gaussian? Remember, n needs to go to infinity. Where do we need n to infinity here? For this inequality, to, for this expression to look like this, you need n to be, n has to go to infinity. Nothing about p. p doesn't have to go to zero or anything. If n goes to infinity and p goes to zero, you get a different approximation. Poisson, not Gaussian. So look here, y is Gaussian. And you remember the relation between x and y. So I'm going to rewrite the x. So y as n goes to infinity, y tends to be Gaussian with this. But x is np plus square root of npq multiplied by y. y is Gaussian. This is a linear combination. This is a linear com So x is a linear combination of Gaussian. So if y is Gaussian, x is Gaussian. Of course, we learned this a couple of weeks back. And look at here. Y, y, is, uh, y has mean zero variance one. Y has mean zero variance one. So the expected value of X is the B here, which is NP. And variance of X is from here, A squared multiplied by variance of Y. Why is that? Because X minus B squared, so you'll get this. So that's going, A squared is square root of NPQ. And X is Gaussian and X also is Gaussian with the mean NP and variance NPQ. And this is uh, that theorem. What, what did I say? The uh, De Moville Laplace theorem. So I completely proved it. So you should know when to take the Gaussian approximation, when to take the normal approximation, etc. Uh, when to take the Poisson approximation. Any questions? Anybody? What about this simple equation? 
Excess variance sigma squared, what's the variance of uh, AX plus B? Anyone? So what's the mean of, uh, uh, what is the mean of Y? Let's start with that. X is zero mean and variance of X is sigma squared. What's the mean and variance of uh, Y? Anyone? And the mean, the variance uh, is square sigma square. Mean? Means B. What? Is B. Right. So look at this. You you. Uh, this is the mean. So the A uh, mean is a linear operation. So it's this. But this is zero. If this was not zero, let's say this is C then this will be AC plus B. That's how you should find out. And the variance of Y, as he said, is uh, from here. So you can see from, so that's the expression of expected value of Y minus its mean. So let's say C is zero, then mean is B squared. So that's going to be Y minus B is A squared multiplied by exp expected value of X, A squared multiplied variance of X. So this you should remember. If a random variable is scaled by a constant, the variance becomes square of that constant. If you add a quantity to a random variable, the variance doesn't change because you are just shifting it. Any questions? Why don't you call Heifeng to come over? So again, let me go back to Gaussian. So I will develop an iterative formula for the characteristic function. Yeah, for the moments. So the question is, what is x to the power n, etc. So we have the characteristic function. I'll start from here. So let me see whether I can derive this. Okay. So this is the characteristic function. I'm going to take the derivative of this. So this is going to be J mu, right? Derivative is with respect to omega. Derivative of this is two, two, two cancels. So you get minus sigma squared omega, right? Multiplied by this whole function. So you get this expression. So let me take the derivative again. So this function multiplied by the derivative of this. So derivative of this is uh, So look here, so let's start with the simple one. This is going to be the derivative of this, which is minus sigma squared multiplied by phi x of omega plus uh, this multiplied by the derivative of this. But the derivative of this is here. So that's going to be Can did I oh, am I making any mistake? Anyone?
Anybody? What did I? Uh, there shouldn't be a. There should not be a square right. Even. Is this correct? Yes or no? Somebody has to speak up. Did I do it correctly? Okay, so what will it be? Why not? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is good, right? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, thank you. So let's see again. Minus sigma squared multiplied by this. And then this multiplied by this. Okay. There shouldn't be a dash on the floor. There shouldn't be what? There shouldn't be a dash on the floor. Here? There should be just pi Right. So this, the derivative of this, which is minus sigma squared, phi x of omega, multi plus this quantity, which is here, derivative of this. That's good. I don't... Uh, I thought something should, uh, okay, so let's do one more time. So if I do this again, maybe you'll see it here. What do you get? So this is, the derivative of this is minus sigma squared phi prime, right? So that I'm going to add it here. So this becomes j mu minus two sigma squared omega phi prime omega, the first term. And the next term is plus j omega minus sigma squared omega double prime. Yes, this is true or false? See the deriv uh, derivative of uh, this, So the derivative of this is minus sigma squared phi prime plus uh, the derivative of uh, this quant. So let, let me let me write it here. Minus sigma squared phi prime plus the derivative of this, which you have to do it in two steps. That's going to be the derivative of this quantity, which is minus sigma squared phi prime, right? And the and plus j omega minus sigma squared omega phi x double prime. So let me write it up, then you see whether you agree or not. Yes or no? Yes? Huh? Yes? No? What did you say? Anybody sitting on the other side? Sitting at your home? Are you paying any attention? Is this true or false? What did you say? Yes. All right, so I'm going to make a guess. I think if I remember, Using this, I'm, I'm going to guess the nth derivative to be, and then we'll prove it, of course. See, remember, this is the third one. So this is n minus one, minus, uh, instead of two, I'm going to call, if it was three here, when it is three here, it is two. Was this n minus one or n minus two? Fan, are you there? Do you remember with the, this expression is right? Fan, ask Fan. Who, who was this student? Fan?
Frederick Fan. Are you calling me? Yeah, yeah. Is this expression correct? My last expression from the video. Uh, uh, yeah, it's correct. Is it here n minus one or n minus two? The second term. Uh, should be uh, minus one. All right. So we are good. N minus one. So the question is: uh, Remember, I just made a guess. So how how do we know this is correct? So I'm going to prove it by induction. Listen to me. This is certainly true if you put n equal to three. Because you can see, if you put n equal to three, you get this the previous expression. So that's good. So I'm going to assume that this is true. Then I'm going to go to the next step. So let's take the derivative of this one more time. That's the proof by induction. I'm just doing it from my memory, and that's the reason I don't. I did it a while ago. So this is p x of n plus one omega. So I have to take the derivative on this side. So derivative of this expression is. I'm going to do it slowly. Minus sigma squared phi of n minus one omega. Then the derivative of this will be minus. Uh, there is a sigma squared here, right? There is a sigma squared here. Two sigma squared. So n my n minus one sigma squared. The derivative of this will be phi x of n minus one. And then I should do the plus j omega minus sigma squared omega derivative of this quantity, which will be phi n of omega. So if I collect this together, I get j omega j uh, j j mu minus sigma squared omega multiplied by phi x of n omega, and I can collect this term and this term together. So this becomes. n sigma squared phi n minus 1 omega so i proved it because this i get back the same iteration this is phi x of n plus 1 all right so for gaussian this is iteration now you just use it to find the uh So what about it? So we, uh, then you then if you know this, then you put uh, omega equal to zero, you get the mean, right? We already know expected value of x is uh, phi x of prime uh, zero uh, by j is uh, mu etc. Right? So you put n equal to So, yeah, and we also know expected value of x squared, which is one over j squared phi x double prime zero is sigma squared. We are not the not sigma squared. That's the uh, that's the uh, second. Uh, oh, you cannot see. <laughs> okay. Now you can find out the third mean etc. using uh, this expression. So the only thing I would say is uh, if you go back here, where is the first one? So that's the iteration. That's the iteration for Gaussian. So, for example, if you go here, if you put um, omega equal to zero. Remember, this term goes away. You get j mu divided by j. You get mu. That's the first expected value. Here, if you put uh, omega equal to zero, this goes away. And uh, what you get is uh, and phi prime. This is already j mu. So you get j mu squared. J mu the whole squared. Here you get minus sigma squared. My my. So you get uh, divided by j squared, you will get to be sigma squared. So from here you get expected value of x squared is I hope you see it, sigma mu squared plus sigma squared. From here you get expected value of x is mu, etc. So you can find out the third mean. To find the third mean, you already have the you already have the second uh, evaluated at zero and the first evaluated at zero. Then you put it in here, you can get, get the third value. So what is interesting about this is, let me do a special case when mu is zero. That's interesting. So when mu is zero, this iteration uh, becomes what? Let's see.
So if X is Gaussian with the zero mean and variance sigma squared, then you get uh, the nth derivative of the characteristic function is, uh, where is the nth derivative? So it's the last expression with the mu equal to zero. So you get minus sigma squared omega phi x of n minus one zero minus n minus one sigma squared phi n minus two. So phi x of remember we, we want the nth derivative at zero. When you put omega equal to zero. So if you want the, we already know the second derivative, right? This is the, the second derivative, if you put uh, omega equal to zero, remember mu is already zero. If you put mu, mu is zero, omega is zero. So this is gone. Then you get minus sigma squared. You see here minus sigma squared. So the second derivative evaluated at zero is minus sigma squared. That divided by j squared, j squared is minus, will give you expected value of x squared to be sigma squared, which is correct. Now you can use this. So I hope you see that all the odd moments are zero because expected value of x is uh, one. So if you go to the third moment, where is it? Where did we do? Oh, you can't see? Okay. So the third moment is look at here. We have the expression here. So mu is zero and this omega is zero, and the first moment is uh, phi prime omega is mu, that's zero. So all the odd moments are zero. So this shows that expected value of x to the power two n plus one is zero. All the odd moments are zero. Many ways you can do this. You can also do this directly. You don't need any of this. Remember, I'm talking about a zero mean Gaussian. Why is this zero? Anybody, anybody has any idea why is this integral zero? This is an even function. What about this? Uh, All right, so odd multiplied by even over a duration is zero, but this is the same result. But interesting thing is if you want a fourth order moment, you put n equal to four. That's n equal to four. So this is minus three sigma squared if you put it here sigma 4 so you get uh, you get a sigma 4 a 3 sigma 4 is the uh, uh, fourth order moment so you get expected value of x4 is 1 over j4 x, uh, the fourth derivative evaluated at 0 that's uh, going to be 3 sigma 4 <coughs> why did i get 3 put n equal to 4 4 minus 1 3 minus sigma squared, then multiplied by minus sigma squared, so you get uh, j4 is one, so you get three sigma four. So expected value of, uh, so you get an iteration, right? Expected value of two n. I'm going to ask you to go home and do this. So this is, so that iteration is what? Minus uh, j, uh, so that's j squared, the numerator is, what was the formula we developed? So that's here, right? I'm, put, I'm going to put n equal to 2n. So you get uh, 2n minus 1. Uh, my, j squared minus 1, I wrote it as j squared. So j squared, 2n minus 1. And you have sigma squared. And this quantity is what? That quantity is j to the power 2n minus 2 multiplied by expected value of x2 and minus 2. So I hope you see this. I got an iterative formula for Gaussian. Go home and make sure this is right.